and graphs again to give you a sort of generic system overview. I thought I'd do a slightly different talk about lecture capture projects in general. Um, uh, we regard ourselves as quite successful. We have a very large installation at Manchester, but um, that wasn't necessarily easy to do, and people don't often like talking about when things go wrong. So I figured that maybe I'd cover some of the stuff which we found particularly problematic in a sort of generalised project management sense, but also some procurement and IT problems that we bumped into. Um, so uh, it seems like from looking at the project on the outside that we started a pilot and then we went into production and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and then that was really successful. And that's largely true, but there's some stuff that happened before that. Um, so uh, it actually took three attempts to get this project to work. Uh, so uh, uh, I've been interested in lecture capture since about 2007 and um, the first time we pitched lecture capture we wanted to do a small number of faculty rooms and uh, we went to the departmental manager but it, they weren't very engaged with lecture capture, it was very new in 2007 um, so, uh, and we didn't really have any specific funding or remit to do it so essentially our first attempt failed because we had no remit and no budget. Um, uh, time passed and then I went on to do um, a study, uh, so I think I've mentioned this a few times but um, uh, we were still doing lecture capture and we were, it was a very manual process taking laptops to classrooms and making recordings. Largely this was driven by students who had clashes. So they had a clash, they couldn't attend two lectures at the same time. So we'd record one and they would attend the other. Uh, but we only gave the recordings to students uh, with the clash. We didn't give it to the whole class and I thought that was problematic. So I went to the academic head of the department and they had lots of concerns about distributing them more widely. They were worried because um, uh, what if attendance dropped, um, that students would probably find it irritating if we were recording one lecture but not the other. Um, and they, you know, those were legitimate concerns. And the, the, the primary bug was they, they were a scientist and they were saying, you know, what's the evidence that this would make any positive difference to students whatsoever? And uh, I did have a look around and in, uh, I think this was uh, 2008 by this point and um, there was nothing really. No, there was a lot of stuff, anecdotal stuff about student satisfaction but no real evidence about it making any kind of educational difference. So uh, we found this magical, awesome unit within the faculty, and it had been taught by the same academics in the same classroom with the same PowerPoint slides for years. And the uh, average unit mark only varied by less than 1%. So it was very consistent over time. Uh, so in the next academic cycle, 2009, the unit was still the same, it was still the same people, still taught in the same room. And the only thing we changed was we recorded uh, the 24 lecture series, and we gave it to the students afterwards. What we ended up with was this. So uh, these are the scores from 2008 and 2007, and then these are some statistical proofs that explain that these are statistically very similar. There's very little difference across the entire grade range. And in 2009, we introduced podcasts, and there's a statistically significant shift across really the mid part of the grade, grade range. So um, sort of there's fewer students failing in the course. The not so good students have started to do better. And then the coming up to the higher end uh, uh, have improved. Doesn't seem to make so much of a difference for the really elite students that are, that are very technically capable. But, but for the mid range, it seemed to make quite a big difference. The sample size here is about 600 students. Uh, we were really interested in this. We thought that it was really good and was some kind of uh, validation that showed that lecture capture was important to them. We also surveyed them to get some anecdotal stuff as well. And uh, the feedback that we got was wall to wall positive. Students thought that this was fantastic and were questioning why we weren't doing it more widely. So uh, time passed. And, uh, and I had another attempt at trying to get a formal lecture capture project going. Uh, so I went to the then, um, there was a senior management role uh, in the university that looked after um, you know, academic practice and the teaching of students. And they had a lot on their plate at the time. So we were trying to roll out Blackboard and uh, that had encountered some problems. There was a lot of academic resistance. Students weren't necessarily happy about it. And uh, so uh, I was told that there wasn't the budget all the time. So um, it was problematic because although lecture capture was a good idea and it was still valid in 2008, uh, 2009 as it was in 2007, there wasn't the kind of senior leadership push to do it. So they, they suggested we went off and did some more study stuff. So, um, so yeah, didn't go anywhere. So it failed a second time really. And the, the thing that made it succeed a third time was there was a change in management at the university. So there was a, there was a change in management at my department. There was a change in management at the senior leadership team. Uh, so um, Richard and uh, Richard, Professor Richard Rees and the person that he reports to, there were two new associate vice presidents and vice presidents appointed. And they had quite different mindsets. They were looking for new technologies and the, the focus had changed in UK HE. So 9,000 pound tuition fees were on the horizon. And suddenly it was very important to make sure that students had a good experience at university, not just to help them academically, but to make their experience at this institution better than other institutions. 
So um, we put together kind of a package proposal for them saying, you know, we want to do lecture capture, we want to do it in a decent number of rooms. So we sort of arbitrarily picked 70 and we went to the academic management and, uh, and they were wildly enthusiastic. They were questioning us why we hadn't started, uh, started this project already, you know, why it had been delayed for so long. So that's how we managed to get access to enough funding to run a pilot. And it's only from then on we'll be successful. But trying to get it off the ground initially was, at Manchester was really quite challenging. And uh, yeah, it's not something that's immediately obvious from looking outside at the project. Um, something else that we found after we started rolling this technology out was working with academics was really rather interesting. So uh, what we thought might drive lecture capture was um, student feedback. So we'd get lecture capture into a small number of rooms and then the student demand would drive it into a larger number of rooms and <coughs> drive the usage of it. But that's not really true as far as we can tell. So um, student feedback, I would say it matters uh, the most to sort of senior leadership types. So if you're in a position to try and enhance the reputation of the university, if you're an academic leader or a head of school, then student feedback means a lot to you. And um, if you're a good academic that's really engaged with those students, um, it probably means a lot to you. But unfortunately, if you're sort of in the middling ground, there seems to be less emphasis on student feedback than you'd expect, even with tuition fees having been brought in. Um, and it's really surprising. So uh, when we uh, when we surveyed students and we asked them what the best resource that they received online was, um, we gave them a few options. So there's PowerPoint slides, uh, learning modules, which are like collections of interactive stuff, discussion boards, and lecture capture. Lecture capture overwhelmingly came out, massive majority, that it's the most important things that students receive. And yet still when we used this to try and drive lecture capture thought forward, there was quite a lot of resistance from academics. It didn't seem to kind of mesh up that, um, that this was an extra resource that they could give their students for free. What they were primarily concerned about was the extra workload it might generate. And they were worried that they'd have to go into a system and administer lots of recordings, you know, individually publish them or individually schedule them or do something in the classroom. That, uh, that, that was basically toxic to, to the approach for lecture capture at Manchester. So we took this feedback away and we worked it into the system, but it was only through doing the piloting and then like doing large rounds of feedback with academics. And then that's how we kind of found out about that middling group Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's kind of strange that student feedback wasn't as strong a driver as we thought, but that it was really important to survey academics to see why they thought that. Uh, and, and again, you know, to come to the conclusion that it was a workload associated thing. And if we hadn't done that in our pilot, I think what would have happened is um, we, our, our system would have been driven by a technically elite group of users. Uh, we had it multiple times during the project where we'd ask the volunteers to come and talk to us from the academics. And we always got the same group, basically. So they were really smart, really engaged, really technical ca technically capable academic users. Many of them were making their own recordings already, so they were just looking to enhance the service that they already provided. It was incredibly difficult to get the middle ground where we literally had to go to individual academics at random and say, you've been selected to provide us with feedback about lecture capture. And it was only then that we started to discover what was important to that middle group and how they felt about student feedback and the possible impact of this system. So um, that was an interesting process, but it's very hard to engage those middle users because they're not engaged to start with. It's difficult to get them to provide feedback to you. And, and uh, even since we've gone into a service, we've set up a, a, a group of academics as a steering group. And um, the idea is that there's a representative from every school and faculty on this group. So it's, it's really difficult to schedule a meeting with them because there's about 28 of them. And the idea behind the group was we wanted to get a broad range of academics from different backgrounds um, and uh, have them provide us feedback on how lecture capture should work. Largely, I'd say what happened was uh, we didn't end up with a broad range of academics. We ended up with, again, the elite technical users because, or for at least 50% of them, because they're the people who are enthusiastic about the technology. They will talk about it in their school and faculty, and then they will give you feedback. And uh, we were, I think at points during the project, we were at risk of, um, because this group is so vocal, we could have created a system that was tailored to what they needed. And what they wanted was something that was incredibly sophisticated with a huge broad range of features, like being able to add your own recordings, quizzes embedded in the recordings, discussion forums stemming from those quizzes, feedback through SCORM data with the kind of things that were being requested. But it's only a very, very small group of users that wanted this. So um, uh, one of the features that this group also asked for was, uh, was editing, for example. So the technically elite users, they're quite happy to log into a web page and edit a recording manually. But when we did the forced survey, when we went to a group of academics who weren't engaged, uh, we asked them, do your recordings need to be edited? And 100% of them said yes for everything. Then we asked, would you actually edit your recordings yourself? 
uh, 1% said yes, that they would sit down regularly, log into a web page, trim a recording. And since we've gone into production, we're now making 30,000 hours plus of recordings a year, and the number of recordings that are edited by academics is 0.4%. So 99.6% is going out completely unedited. But if you'd just <coughs> used the technical survey data, you would have strongly believed that editing was an absolute requirement, that the people would be willing to sit down and edit. It's only by engaging the, the unengaged group that, um, that it made a difference. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about uh, with procurement of open source lecture capture is actually really complicated and very difficult. So I'll probably spend about 10 minutes on this and then I'll take questions. So one of the major problems we had with engaging an open source solution was buying it. And in the UK, we're kind of set up with a model where um, you want a new solution, so you tender it. And you come up with a script of what you want, then you put that out to tender. Um, traditionally, open source does not get a look in at that. There's very few open source providers, and the ones that do exist don't really vend complete solutions. So we were quite lucky that we went through a competitive process. So we wanted to find out how much are we going to spend on lecture capture? Do we have to tender it, or does this need to be a competitive process? Uh, so in order to do that, we got financial quotes from um, uh, several companies that included the, the likes of Echo360, Panopto, MediaSite, and um, we were lucky that we'd encountered Entwine at a previous uh, event, and we encouraged them to uh, uh, provide us with a financial estimate. But I don't think they would have come across that tender process naturally. Um, it's just not something that seems to happen in the open source world. And the problem with their bid was, uh, it was by far the cheapest, which was fantastic, but they don't vend a complete solution. So um, what n one were offering us was that they would create a back-end system that was fully capable of doing all the lecture capture that we needed in the way in which we wanted to do it, which is uh, open cast. Um, but they don't vend capture agents. So uh, we had this kind of disconnect where suddenly the project became not to buy a lecture capture solution. It then sort of divided into three where we needed to procure back end lecture capture service and then something to go in classrooms to do the recordings. So that was reasonably straightforward buying the back end and to provided the cheapest quote when we went with them. Uh, then they kind of offered us consultation about uh, acquiring a capture system. So we, we did again some surveying of the markets, so what we did to get hardware samples from vendors and quotes and estimates of cost. Um, but that wasn't straightforward either. So it turned out the solution that we ended up looking at wasn't wholly vended by the vendor. So um, we had uh, we had some samples from Epifan and Encast and a couple of others. And we had Galacaster, which was free and open source, so we weren't paying for it. And it wasn't part <coughs> of the com competitive process, effectively. It was a zero cost option. And then Brickholm shifted again, and what we had to do was buy PCs. So the project went into a third phase of procurement where we were looking at, ah, right, so now we've, we've <coughs> chosen an open source solution because it was the cheapest. Now procurement is about trying to acquire a PC that fits the open source solution that we've chosen. <coughs> so we went through a third wave of competitive procurement, which is very tiring at this point. And uh, we had to go to all our contracted PC suppliers. And at this point, it was easier to come up with a spec. So we went to our classrooms. And uh, there's desks like this in almost every one of our classrooms. Uh, some of them are fantastic. And they have great big enclosures. You could fit a whole one new rack mounted server in there. It's not a problem. But, uh, uh, other ones, they had incredibly small spaces, and so we went around with, we were measuring the space that was required, we were looking at the capture systems that we had to install, and we ended up coming up with a specification that was a given size, about the size of a child's lunchbox. Um, and uh, it had to have a full height, full depth PCI card slotting. We didn't want anything to be USB, because people in this institution like to unplug cables. Yeah, if their cable is exposed, they will unplug it. Um, it's only a matter of time. Um, uh, so uh, at this point we went to all our PC vendors and we, we gave them a specification and none of them could meet it unfortunately. So we, we had pre-approved people that we had to go through first like Dell or Viglin and uh, they could either come up with a box that was small enough but didn't have the capacity for a ca capture card or they could give us a capture card box but then the box was too big. So then we had to go outside of our normal contracts, so it was almost a fourth wave of procurement uh, process where we then had to go to commercial manufacturers of small form factor PCs. We managed to find a couple, but uh, they vet, they're not on our approved list, but we were okay to go outside of this. Their parents agreed that we couldn't buy that from any of our approved suppliers. And then we ended up acquiring this hardware. And then since we've established a relationship with our hardware supplier, it's been really easy after that. They're the best supplier of small form factor PCs in the UK, and they could give us exactly what we wanted, a really small box that entirely fits a capture card that we can fit into a small desk. But that entire process of procurement from start to finish with is it tender, yes, no, is it competitive process, yes, no, what is it you're specifically buying, it was very, very, very lengthy and very, very difficult. Um, 
is if, I think if we did the process again today, it would be different, because when we initially started procurement, we were only looking at 70 rooms, so it's way less than a European tender level uh, type arrangement. And uh, when it was broken down into a t sort of two individual things that we were buying at back end and recording systems, the actual costs were so low that we were just getting multiple quotes uh, through the system. But it's something that I feel is really kind of missing in the open source community. There's not someone I can really go to and say, vend me an entire capture solution with a front end and a back end that aren't necessarily linked where I could decide to go to a different system if I wanted. So um, it was one of the things that was probably most complicated about the project is buying stuff. And I think it's, it's probably one of the major weaknesses of open source is it's amazing and it's cheap but difficult to buy in a way. Although the software is free, trying to get it to run on something can be quite logistically diff difficult. I know that um, Sussex, for example, uh, they went a completely different way. So they, they, I think they reformed back to their desks or something and they just bought generic PCs from their established suppliers and that worked much better for them because they were, they were going down an established pre-approved procurement route, which was really direct. Um, similarly with the back end, we were quite lucky because we'd had a, a big VM architecture refresh. So we had a lot of VMs and they're all internally vended. But it's again that strange aspect of um, when you're going through these competitive processes, you have external companies that are providing or offering solutions. And then it was almost like IT was acting like a third or a fourth um, vendor to itself, which is um, slightly strange. Um, and so I think, I think the last thing that I wanted to cover that's sort of outside of Richard's presentation was um, uh, so something that I think he didn't mention was uh, we started off quite simply with our project and uh, I think there's a weird unseen contract that uh, uh, works around lecture capture with academics so um, we offered a given solution during our pilot and we did it because it was practical and fairly cheap so all we're doing is recording what's coming out of the projector at 30 frames a second and uh, there's a microphone over there, that's what we record. That turned out to be one of the best decisions we ever made. So um, what we hadn't figured out is that on day one, whatever it was we were offering on the first day, academics immediately expected that that would be the final product that would be rolled out to theatres. So we, we went around and we visited some other institutions that were doing lecture capture, and they'd used one or sometimes even two cameras, uh, complicated switching gear, multiple microphones that all mucked back into the same audio track, and multi-stream capture. And they managed to do that in one room, and then as soon as they looked at scaling that out to additional rooms, um, it was just financially unviable, and people wouldn't accept anything less than the incredibly high-quality service that they'd already experienced. They couldn't really understand why that wouldn't be available in additional rooms. But I think we've been incredibly lucky, so what we've done is I say our lecture capture is rudimentary, so it's, um, it's good, it's successful, people are very happy about it. But what it is is fundamentally very basic, but incredibly ubiquitous. So we've pushed really hard to get it in as many rooms as possible in its most basic state, and then add features later. So the QR codes come later, cameras come later. And uh, those have seen a sort of incremental improvements by the user. I think that's worked really well with academics and students, because we've initially launched a basic service, and they were perceived to be uh, improving it over time uh, in small incremental bursts. So there's nothing you know, titanic that's changing about it. It's really changing the way that they have to work. And again, I think that's probably one of the best things that we did in the entire project. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's quite a brief presentation because most of my stuff's been taken care of by either Richard um, or James. There's um, a third presentation by someone at Manchester, which I think is this afternoon. Uh, so Andy Wilson's going to cover something that I have, which is about robustness and stability. So we were doing some statistics before um, before we came to the conference, trying to figure out how reliable our system's been. I think in the last 800 hours of recording, <coughs> we had one failure because some idiot went and unplugged the cable that goes into our capture system. Um, and so Andy Wilson is going to talk about um, how we achieve the level of robustness where you can get a 1 in 800 failure rate. So outside of that, any questions about the stuff that I've talked about? Okay. Uh, you showed the evolution of the grades in 2015. When we started uh, three years ago, uh, I took up from a wider base. Uh, our first experience was in informatics is that grades decreased. <laughs> was uh, interesting, astonishing. Uh, so my question, uh, why do you think uh, that uh, the, the, the output increase in your situation? Do you have any idea? Uh, so let me go back to the graph. 
Um, so it's hard to know. I mean, this is correlation evidence, which is almost the worst kind of evidence. There could have been some other unseen factor that I'm completely unaware of that happened in that year that could have increased the grade. And it's only a sample size of 600, so we don't really know much beyond that. So um, I don't have a good answer for why I think that happened. We just know that we introduced one variable and then there was a change, potentially <coughs> as a result or maybe not. What we're trying to do at the minute is repeat the study, but on a much larger scale. So um, we've got data from last year, which was our first really large year in production, where we've got nearly 3,000 student records, I think, of their, who they are and what their examination results were. We've then got 500 million lines of logs. Uh, I think, yeah, it's about that order. So we do pseudo streaming. So every time a chunk of data is delivered to a student, it records their IP, their username, what, what URL they were accessing, what file, and how much data was sent. And we've built an enormous database, it's really very large, and um, uh, it references the students' exam results, their users, what courses they're on, and these URLs and all the data in the logs. So we want to do a study across 10 courses where we look at the course in the same year, we look at who used podcasts the most, the middle, and the least, and not at all, and then do a comparison of the different demographics to see if there's any statistical difference between their examination results. Unfortunately, we're only about halfway through doing that, so I don't have any data to show for this conference. But we're going to write a paper up whether it's good or bad results. Mm -hmm. So we, we may have the same outcome as you, I don't know. But, um, but I think it's still a valid thing to do. I think when we, when we originally started doing this, the focus was on academic performance. Does it make a difference? But since then, in the UK, the focus has kind of shifted to say that this is for the benefit of students in a more anecdotal way because they're paying so much in fees, they deserve extra resources. And lecture capture, for, although it's an expensive thing to do, it's a really cost-effective way of turning money into positive student feedback. Yeah. So in short, I don't have an answer for you yet, but hopefully soon. Um, any other questions? Cool, I guess that's the end of my talk. Thank <laughs> you.